Hi, today I'd like to talk about coordinates, datums, and map projections. These are the way we fix things in space and assign locations that are unique and stable for our features. And that way we can combine features from data layers we've collected at different times with different methods and making sure that those features line up on top of each other. We have two general views of the world. One is this rather complex latitude-longitude sphere. And then the other is a planar system. In our GIS, we typically store this planar system. So you see this green square. We have a north arrow heading up in the y direction and an east arrow in the x direction. And up is vertically out of the plane. Unfortunately, the world isn't a plane. The world is a sphere. And when we're working with small areas, the sphere and plane are almost the same, but as that plane gets bigger, the deviation from the sphere in area, in direction, and in shape gets too big to manage. Since we want our JS to be seamless across space and to bring different data in from different projects, we typically store our data in a planar system or in a geographic or spherical system and convert back and forth through something called a map projection. That's the next lecture. So we have to be aware of both systems, but first we have to be aware of this latitude, longitude, or spherical system because that's the base against which all other things are measured. We typically imagine the world as being a plane and of things being measured relative to each other on that plane. That's fine as long as we stay within our small area, but we can't take this planar representation and generalize it across space because as I noticed, or as I mentioned earlier, the planes and the spheres vary. But still the plane is our Cartesian system, and by Cartesian I mean it's this right angle system where all the lines are parallel to each other in either east-west or north-south direction, and they intersect at a right angle. Now, if I extend this, I have to distort the world. If I have a system that's just set for a small area and I optimize for that small area, my measurements can be consistent. But if I switch to a different area, let's say 200 miles north, and use this same system, the errors will compound and 300 miles north the errors, their distortions get even greater. So even for the whole state of Minnesota, I have a hard time finding a Cartesian system, a right angle system, that I can use from south to north in the whole state. There isn't anything that fits the state well enough so that I don't get huge distortions on the orders of several feet in a mile. And if you're working with a property line, if you tell somebody that their property next to the neighbors is off by several feet, they're not going to be happy with you. So we have to work with the spherical system. The spherical system has a latitude and a longitude. So these are measures of angular displacement around an axis. Now in this case it's the North Pole axis for the longitude, and it's an axis at right angles to that North Pole axis for the latitude. We're going north and south at right angles to the equator. So the latitude is how far north you go, the longitude is how far east you go, with an origin 0, 0 that's set arbitrarily on Earth. Now there's another measurement, a radius, for a simple spherical system. For an ellipsoidal system, which you talk about in the book, there are two radii, one in the equatorial direction and one in the polar direction. And we need both of those because although neither of these is an exact model of the Earth, the ellipsoid gets closer to the true shape of the Earth. Because as we noted, as the Earth spins, it kind of bulges in the middle and flattens north to south, right? We have 360 degrees around the equator or around through the poles. You might wonder, why do we have this weird 360 degree measure, 60 minutes to a degree and 60 seconds to a minute? Well, the Sumerians, who kind of developed this as a practical tool 4,000 years ago, realized that if I have a radius and I lay that radius around a circle, it's approximately six times around the radius fits. 
And so I can very practically lay out circles or distances or measure angles by using these radial or radius measures. And since there were six of them, they said, well, we want it to split equally. And they used a base 10 system. So they said, we're going to have 60 degrees for each of these subtended areas. And 6 times 60 is 360. And in keeping with that, they wanted to have the 60 minutes because they wanted to subdivide it further in 60 seconds to make their math easy. So they developed it that long ago. We've stuck with it. You could redefine everything and redefine mathematics by saying we're going to have a thousand units or 10,000 units around a circle, but this works and it works with a bunch of the math, so we've stuck with it. Old habits die hard. So the latitude and longitude is not a Cartesian system. Because remember, a Cartesian system, the axes and the lines are always parallel to each other. They never intersect. And of course, this latitude-longitude system converges. The lines of longitude, equal longitude in the north-south direction, all hit at the poles. You may see maps where they've splayed this out, but what they're doing basically is cutting it and stretching it so that the North Pole is a line across the top and it distorts the shape of all the continents or islands underneath it. So it's not a Cartesian system. All the Cartesian geometry learned in high school doesn't work on this spherical surface and there's a specialized set of measurements and mathematics. One of the useful things to keep in mind is that we always measure distances in a great circle distance. I'll have a graph in a second that'll show you a great circle is any plane that cuts through the center, intersects the center of the sphere, defines great circles. And so it has to be on a plane that if extended through the center of the earth, um, actually hits the center. And if we know the radius or the angle, we can calculate the distance. I'm sorry, the radius and the angle. Or if we know the distance and the radius, we can calculate the angle that we've traversed, again, along these great circle paths. Now, these great circle paths are the shortest distances on a sphere. So there are these straight line distance, even though they might appear curved in a lot of renditions of maps of the surface of the Earth. You also have to realize that we use radian measures. So radians are how many radiuses we've gone in the angle. It's odd because we're used to using degrees in trigonometry in grade school and high school. One radian is the length of a radius laid around a circle, right? So there's what, three point or two pi, so 3.14 times two or 6.28 radians around a circle. One radian is 57.2957 degrees. So we have to do this conversion that's inconvenient. Now again, great circle distances are shorter dis shortest distances on spheres. They're used in measurements on spheres when we're doing the measurements to try and locate things. And they often appear curved depending on how you view them. Unless you view them from directly above, they will appear curved on this surface of the Earth. A great circle splits the Earth into two equal parts or any sphere. Now, a small circle is a circle for a plane that cuts through the sphere, but it just that small circle doesn't go through the central point. So we want, always want to make measurements in great circles. Right? We define horizontal reference surfaces and a set of well-measured points to define a datum. A datum is a systematic set of well-measured points that we use as the base for all our positioning. So we have to both have the sphere and the points on the sphere. So we have to come up with a set, in this case, in, this, in the book, a horizontal or semi-major axis in this vertical or polar or semi-minor axis. Then this equation defines this ellipsoid, which is a special kind of sphere. Now, if A equals B, it's just a sphere, and we'll call it a spheroid. And then we also have to define the location of the center. For the center location and then the length and orientation, we've defined this sphere or ellipse in space. Then we have to measure points on top of it and locate those points. And those two things together, a definition of an ellipsoid or a definition of a sphere, and the well-measured points on top of it, often monumented, give us a datum. Well, how do we know where the center is? It's 
essentially by measuring to the stars. The stars are a stable reference surface. At the same time of day, at the same day of the calendar year, the Earth is in the same orientation. If we measure stars relative to those from different spots around the Earth, we can identify where the Earth is relative to those. And if we measure those in different times of the year, we can also improve our notion of where the Earth is in the orbital path. That's effectively how we do it. We're measuring against the stars that are stationary as far as we're concerned, right? So these astronomical observations help us locate where the Earth is and if we're on different parts of the Earth, the shape of the Earth. So that's how we, in really broad figures, get the shape of the Earth and the location of the Earth. Then we measure again using a combination of astronomical measurements and measurements across the surface of the Earth, well-defined points. Right? So we'll put a monument in or locate something that isn't going to move, a spot on a rock, a chiseled hole, um, a bronze disc we'll put in the cement into the rock, and then we'll measure from its distance to other locations and angles, and that's how we develop, basically, a survey network. So astronomical observations to get the shape of the Earth, the specific spheroid or ellipsoid we're going to use, and then laborious ground measurements to get the locations of points. Then anything else we want to measure, we can measure relative to those points. Now you have to realize since coordinates are measured, all measurements contain errors. Right? So we'll have assumptions about the shape of the Earth and where locations are, and then we'll make measurements out from them. But it might be a rainy day or a foggy day or it might be difficult to get uh, repeat the measurements. There's a little bit of error in the instruments and in the person using it. So these distances won't be measured to whatever arbitrary accuracy you want and hence there'll be some error in the measurements. If I retake the measurements I will get a different distance. And over the last 400 years we've struggled to improve these with major leaps, with major improvements in technology so that we get hyper-accurate measurements. And we've come pretty far. Really, the last 30 years are kind of the golden age of measurements where for relatively low cost in time and money, we can get millimeter measurements, sub-inch measurements, you know, tens, hundreds of inch, when it used to be thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, and um, years of measurement to get that accuracy. But what is our system based on now? It's this really the very long baseline interferometry. A bunch of huge radio antennas that are focused on quasars. There's about a hundred of them around the world and they measure them simultaneously as the Earth spins. And with very sophisticated analysis we can locate those precisely to, at any point in time to within millimeters, so hundreds to thousands of inches for the antenna center focus point. From those then we can use GPS or um, various other satellite-based systems and ground-based timing systems to locate a much greater dense D network of points. So we have points all over most of the continents that are measured at every point in time. And as we measure over changing times, we can actually get the velocities. That's how we measure plate tectonics. That's one of the ways we know how long these relative vectors are is because we have points all along these um, or among these plates and we're measuring them precisely using that network of VLBI, GPS, Doris, and other things and we get the locations again at millimetric levels tracked through time. So we can talk about the velocity. But with these new measurement methods we have to say when we made all our measurements, because a measurement of a location today and a measurement of a location next year are going to be different. They will have shifted because of continental drift by a few millimeters, so we have to measure the epoch. It's only in the last 10 years we've had to do that. So we have systems that are quite accurate that allow us to locate the latitude and longitude um, very, very precisely. The problem is that in the transition from the 1980s when we used the old technology to now, we wanted to use the best data possible. So there are several updates or changes in the datums because we had a different set of measurements. Remember I said we use both a set of measurements 
and an ellipsoid. Well, as these measurements improve, improve day by day and year by year, and we have the computing capacity, we wanted to improve them and change our datums. And so we have a bunch of datums over the last 20 years until they've stabilized, in which case improvements now into the future really won't help much. We've gotten to sub-inch accuracies, and most people in commerce and day-to-day -day life don't really care about better than sub-inch accuracies. But we have a succession of datums that you'll have to deal with in your professional life if you use GIS. Now this is all horizontal measurement. When I look at vertical measurement, we use a different system. We used a gravity-based system. And the reason we do this is because the Earth isn't really shaped like a spheroid or an ellipsoid. It's lumpy. There's about a 200 meter difference between the highs and lows. And these aren't due to tides or waves or anything like that. They're due to differences in the density of the Earth. And the denser the Earth, basically the stronger the gravitational pull. So the Earth pulls down in some areas more than others. And the world bulges and, and um, <clears throat> sinks in locations depending on the relative strength of the, that gravitational pull. Now, these agreed-upon reference services are based on survey networks. In the old days, we used surface surveys up until 1980. Now we use GPS surveys and connect to those relative to those using GPS instruments. So we have all these locations that we've measured horizontally, but we've also measured them vertically. So what we're doing is we're measuring on the surface of the Earth and we reduce down to this ellipsoid, this agreed upon surface with a zero zero near the mass center of the Earth, right? We've located that from astronomical measurements, and then we have to, any point you measure, reduce it to the center of the Earth. And so we have a location here that's a latitude longitude, and then we have a height above the geoid, above this surface, relative to our latitude and longitude on the spheroid. So we have first to define the horizontal and then we can define the vertical. <clears throat> now, I said we have a whole bunch of different datums. It's because there's that pre and post satellite period, right? Datums were national. We had these networks going across this, the continents because we mostly used optical measurements. The origin was near the geometric center of the Earth, but our measurements of the stars weren't that great. So the geometric center wasn't really as well placed and relative to the mass center. Um, we fixed the stations of measurements and we propagated error from there. See, we had this notion beforehand that if we measured the plates and we measured on these plates, they were stable. And so once we got measurements improved to points, those points would be static. The points really didn't move around. But it was in the 1960s where it became clear that, no, the plates actually are moving around. A bunch of data came together from various observational um, efforts and studies to say, no, it's unequivocal. The plates are moving, and the static view of the world is no good. And so that occasion sort of a switch to satellite-based global datums. The idea was instead of having just one static earth we measure, we have to measure the plates, points on them, and how they're moving. And that drove the development of satellite geodesy and these ELBIs and the whole network we have now. We have to periodically re-estimate the location of things and measure how the plates are moving and distribute the air in our measurements across the network. We have to really worry about point velocities and worry about when we took our measurements. So why did our datums change? Well, when we were doing static measurements, the notion was, well, as we increase the number of points, we get a better fit of our ellipsoid, but we'll at some point get a perfect fit, and then we'll just have the ellipsoid measured. We now realize, oh, that these points are moving, and they're moving differently in some parts of the world than the other, and we have different sets of measurements in different locations. But basically the idea is that we'll have different ellipsoids. So as our satellite measurements improve, we have a series of different ellipsoids that we estimated, and more importantly, a series of points. There are two main ones 
that have been implemented over the last 30 or 40 years. One is mostly in the U.S., this GRS-80 and 8083, and the other is this WGS-84. Now, ITRF, is it's also called. The reason there are these two different ones is that the U.S. measured first and set up a network, and then as measurements got better and the rest of the world joined in, they, in collaboration, came up with a better ellipsoid, better location. Mostly the size didn't vary much, but the mass center, the location, or origin did. And so they just all adopted that because it was the best measurement at the time. We had a bunch of surveyors that had all their coordinate systems, all their locations, all their coordinates identified relative to this old one, the N8083 GRS-80. And we decided not to shift it to make it easier on those folks so they didn't have to recalculate all their point locations. Because for work generally within the U.S., this offset didn't cause much in the way of errors initially. So lat longs change when we reduce to different ellipsoids. Ours is different than the WGS84 or the ITRF. So there's a basic switch, a basic for the same point on the surface of the Earth when I project down or reduce to the ellipsoid. The WGS84 ITRF is different from the N8083. The coordinates fall in a different place. And over most of the U.S., it's about a meter difference, you know, half a meter in some parts of the U.S., more than a meter in another part, other parts of the U.S. And that's part of the reason that we have different coordinates, different latitudes and longitudes for the same point. If you look up a well-defined point location, we have different latitudes and longitudes they differ way out here, right, in the hundreds to thousands of degrees, but still they're different, right? 23.0 or 0 0.23074, um, 0 0.22405, so, or 0 0.23047. These are for different uh, datums fit for different periods of time. Remember, as you get an increase in the number of points in a better analysis of those points and better measured points, your estimate of all the locations changes because you're estimating one relative to the other. And so with different datums, we have different um, measurements, different uh, locations. And so you have to be careful to make sure that we have uh, the same datum when you're combining data. You have to have the same location base, the same ellipsoid and the same um, set of measurement points against which things are measured. So the datums change. Well, how much do the datums change through time? From the pre-1980s datum to the first 1980s datum, there's about a 120-foot shift on average in the U.S., 100 foot, something like that. And then the NAD-83s, through time, as we developed the satellite-based system, um, shift some. You know, this, in this particular case, this is four centimeters and five centimeters. They're shifting about two inches between these different datums as they improve. And then there's that difference in the WGS84. Remember, we have a different origin for our ellipsoid, and so there's about a meter difference for this particular well-measured point. So within the N8083 family, the shifts aren't great for this point. For some po points, these are in the 20 to 30 centimeter range or foot range. But um, after that, it's a few inches. As the measurements got better and better from the early 1980s until really today, we do have that one convention difference, though, that drives the difference between the WGS84 slash ITRF and the NAD83, which we use mostly in the US. And that's about a meter off. As you see, the points clustered here are various changes in location for a point as our measurements get better, not as the point moves. And then the difference due to convention between the ellipsoid the rest of the world uses and the ellipsoid we use here in the U.S., right? So our coordinates change within each family of datums or between families of datums. These coordinates change through time within the family because we get better measurements for each datum, which is that we get more and better measurements within the datum, not them more and better datums. I created this for the first textbook or second edition to show how these 
these coordinates and datums change through time. Now, each of these is a different datum. It's a different estimate of where points are and perhaps a different ellipsoid or spheroid for the shape of the Earth. So there was one in 1986 for the NAD83 family. There was a quick succession one in 89, 88, 89, the Harn system, because they realized while they were bringing this out that this GPS allowed us to make much better measurements, much more accurately, but they couldn't coordinate it across the country. So they led each state or small consortiums of state to develop their own local networks. So the difference between the original N8083, the 1986 version, and this Harn was up to a meter, right? And then they basically organized all these between 1989 and 1998 and came up with this CORS 96, our first datum. And so a meter to here, but there's 5 to 20 centimeters, so 2 to 8, 10 inches in error in shift in these points due to differences in technology. And then since the CORS 96, there's been a 2007 and a 2011 and later versions, and all, they're all pretty much the same. We've got enough measurements that are GPS-based and good enough everywhere that this has become pretty stable. But there are big differences, and if someone just says, I have NAD83 data, you have to ask which flavor, which datum, the 1986, the original, the Harn, or the later ones that are pretty stable. Parallel with that, there's the WS84, which is developed by the U.S. Department of Defense, and the ITRF, which is the International Terrestrial terrestrial reference frame, which is the rest of the world for the most part. And these two have become aligned. Since these are global datums, people using them all over the world, they have a slightly different ellipsoid, a different mass center, and they're updated frequently and take into account plate tectonics and plate movement. So these are updated. There was one in 92 and 94 and 2000. Now, if you're making measurements in 96, they were probably relative to 94. And the good thing is, every time you come up with a new datum, you usually develop equations that allow you to transform back to the old datum or transfer forward. So when they came with the ITRF 2000, they developed equations that said, I can calculate where this point was relative to the ITRF 94, and then I can go from the 94 to the 92. Similarly, People have gone to the trouble of calculating the transformation across these. So I can say if I have a point in the NAD83 course 96, I can apply a set of equations called the datum transformation to figure out where that would be in the RTF94. So that if I have data in one system, I can combine it with data in the other system by applying a mathematical transformation first. It basically says, look, I have these two different reference systems. What I'm going to do is tell you how to go from this one, if I measured it in this system, to this one. So I can take advantage of data that somebody else measured and, and um, provided to me along with the documentation of what datum they're using. And that's a datum transformation that does that. Right? So these three main families of datums, I can transform between them, and I do that using software now. The standard base software is this HTTP. They're coming out with a new, pool, new tool at the National Geodetic Survey. I can go in and enter a set of points, and they will tell me how to go from one to the other. Right? If you're not in the right datum, you can be off by a few inches to six feet. So if you get that transformation wrong, you're going to be really messed up. Now, we can fix this with a datum transformation to make sure things match if the data were accurately measured in the first place. And these datum transformations get applied within ARC inside a map projection. So you have to be careful and know when you're doing one and which one you're doing. Now the NGS programs, they're just the datum transformation side, so it's a geographic to geographic transformation. Within a map projection, ARC does this datum transformation between the map projection, which we'll talk about later. And so it sometimes gets hidden and it's subtle. Some people don't know they're even doing this. What does a datum transformation look like? Well, we have one sphere that's our starting sphere, let's say the ITRF, and another sphere that's our ending sphere, the NAD83 cores 96. The X prime, Y prime, Z prime are the 
three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. And so what we do is we have a point here in the original. We apply a translation that as we move the origin, the x, y, and z, we may scale it if one is a little larger than the other, one ellipsoid is a little larger than the other. Then we rotate around all three axes, and so we can take a point on this surface and say where it would be on this surface. That's what the datum transformation does. It transforms from one datum to another. You have to pick the input and output datum, and if you're very cautious, you can actually add the time, so this horizontal time-dependent positioning saying, I'm going to go from a datum at a certain time to another datum at a certain time. And they have in this NOAA tool, the NGS, National Geodetic Survey, the various name datums in the equations behind to do that translation, rotation, and scale. So I'm doing a bunch of these sorts of things uh, when I'm doing a datum transformation. Now, again, I can go anywhere up and down, but sometimes I'm here, let's say in the horn, and I want to go down to the I tier of zero, and there is no direct transformation between them. What I'll often have to do is go from the horn to something like the cores 96, and the cores 96 to the um, let's say WGS 84, 873, or the ITRF 94, and then from the ITRF 94 to the ITRF 2000. So I often have to chain these together. And in the software, it will show you what transformations it's using. So if one exists, let's say from the cores 96 to the NAD 83 2011, it shows you it's doing that. But if you need multiple, it'll say, I'm going to do NAD83 Harn, NAD83 to, to Harn, Minnesota, and then the NAD83 course 96 to the NAD83 Harn. So that gets it from the NAD83 to the NAD83 course 96. So I might have to do an intermediate transformation. I might have to say, okay, going from here to here, then from here to here, and apply multiple transformations. You've got to be careful in ARC because they call this old N8083, the 86 version, just the N8083. And if you're looking for it, you might find that and say, well, I don't know, I don't see the 96 to the 2011 version, and I'm just going to apply that. Uh, they would be nice if they would have put the 86 here, but when they wrote the software, they didn't because there really wasn't the cores 96 or all of these. The software was written while this was going on, and they haven't seen fit to update it. So it can be confusing. You should realize that the NAD83 is the NAD83 1986, if they don't say anything else, and it's stored differently in a different location. This has caused more errors for people that don't understand map projections and datums than almost anything else ARC has done. Part of the reason you're taking this course, I guess. All right? Make sure you have the year modifier. If you dig into ARC documentation, they show you what the modifiers are and what are the various um, well-known IDs and the accuracies and the transformation, but you have to dig in the documentation, and a lot of people don't.